How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling with Brian Alvarez. Uh, we'll be taking phone calls and emails throughout the show. We've got tons of emails over the last couple of days since we've been gone, since we took yesterday off. And Brian, how are you? I'm doing good. That's good. Uh, I guess we'll start. I was on the plane, so I did not get to see Thunder last night. What's, uh, what's going on? Well, the thing with Thunder was we were talking yesterday about Lex Luger and Chuck Palumbo and how horrible Lex Luger and Sean O'Hare was. And I was absolutely expecting the utter worst from this match. And i got to say that I think, at worst, it was the third worst match on the show. Sean does, that Stasiak, that the the rest of, does that mean that the rest of the show... Well, I heard the Sean Stasiak-Norman Smiley match was the worst. That was just... That was one of the most horrible matches I've seen all year. And uh, oh I actually think that that match was worse than Lex Luger and Sean O'Hare, only oh because God. Sean Stasiak and Norman Smiley were both trying. And with Lex Luger and Sean O'Hare, Luger was obviously um, trying to make it as horrible as possible. So uh, for two people that were actually trying to have an acceptable match, you wouldn't even believe how bad it was. And then it was uh, Rick Steiner and Hugh Morris, which also I thought was worse than Luger and Palumbo, because Rick Steiner, this match was like ten minutes long, and... I swear, for nine full minutes, Rick Steiner did, did not do one thing. It was like chin lock after chin lock, stand there, look at the fans. That was just horrible. And the one thing about Luger and Palumbo was that I don't know what they told Luger after his match with O'Hare. They must have chewed him out or something because he went out there and actually had, I would say it was a good match, but they tried to make it competitive. And um, it wasn't a, it wasn't like Luger like the last time Luger just pummeled him forever and then Palumbo got a small package out of nowhere. This one was like back and forth the whole match. Luger went for the rack and then Palumbo just kind of slipped out and did a schoolboy and pinned him. So um, it was ten times better as far as uh, the way it was set up and trying to get Palumbo over than the last did, Palumbo match and the last O'Hare match. But um, did the did the announcing uh, get it get it over like it was a big deal or did they just go out Palumbo one and never? Oh, they tried. Made? They tried. they tried, okay, good. But, good. I mean, you know, Tony Schiavone, he can try as hard as he wants, and uh, it's just not going to work. But they did try. And uh, I thought um, Shane Helms and Elix Skipper was pretty damn good. Um, I'm like a how huge is, how is Elix Jay, how Skipper is, fan lately. How was Jason Broyles? Uh, it was Scotty O and Jason B. And uh, that match was not too bad, actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the fans, you know, they didn't care for the... Uh, um, Scotty O and Jason B. I can't even believe they gave him that name, but they did. The why, don't they just call Jason Bro why don't they just call him Jason Broyles? Because I don't, e I don't know. If I, I mean, I can see why they call Scotty O Scotty O, because Overholzer is a really long name. Yeah, but why can't they just give him a gimmick last name like uh, any other Scott, promotion that is like ever Scotty, existed? Like Scotty Smith? Yeah, generic. Scotty Smith, Scotty whatever. <laughs> Scotty Saber. Scotty Tuati. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but anyway, that was all right. Um, Evan's looking a little bit better. I mean, nobody looked embarrassing. It was one of those, it was kind of like Monday where they just did like a whole bunch of dives and uh, it was just dive after dive after dive. But, um, you know, nobody looked bad. And uh, overall, uh, main event was just the main event. Steiner, Nurse, Miller, exactly what you expect. And uh, they did another one of those deals where um, they destroyed something for absolutely no reason. It was Canyon and Smooth. Canyon was angry at Smooth, claiming that he was the one that alerted everybody, or that alerted uh, Ernest Miller that he was going to be at the hospital on Nitro, even though anybody watching How TV would know he was going to be there because he told the nation uh, before he went. But anyway, he got mad at Smooth and proceeded to take a forklift and uh, tip the limo over and destroy it. And then he ran off. So didn't, didn't we see that? Didn't, didn't we see that before? Yes, they destroyed a limo to prolong a feud between Canyon and Smooth. Well, they did something because WWF did it on a big pay-per-view, and WWF can afford it. And, and what was the, uh, what was the angle on the WWF, WWF actually? What? What was the angle on the WWF pay-per-view? Well, Hunter, they did the four, the four people, Hunter and Austin, two top stars in the big money match, not well, Canyon and, also, and Smooth. For a company that can't afford it. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know. Uh, why do they think do they think people tune in to see cars broken? Yeah, I mean, if Canyon and Ernest Miller were headlining and the company was making money, that would be one thing. But um, well, if they were making money, of course it's one thing. But not only are they losing money, but this is like a very deep undercard feud. Also, how, how much how much do limos go for that you destroy, even even if it's a gimmick limo? Uh, 
I don't know. I, I mean, even the WWF, it wasn't like they got a, a brand new uh, Lexus and dropped it off the forklift. Yeah. yeah it was Somebody, some. I, I'm really curious what that is because now that we're going to start seeing guys fired, like uh, Chris Ford was, uh, Crowbar was fired today. I want to like see like the, the amount of money they spend breaking televisions and things like that, and then like on the other end, watch wrestlers get released. Yeah. You know, to make up that to make up that money that's being lost. I mean, how much? Just compare uh, Chris Ford's contract to the price of the limo. I don't know. That's that's what scared me when I started thinking about that. It's like for some, you know, they they'll, they'll cut a guy. I mean, I don't know if it's like a direct correlation, but they cut. You know, they're cutting a guy to save money, and then they're like. You know, smashing limos. Yeah. I mean, and again, you're right. If they were smashing a limo for a hot top of the card feud, it's one thing. But when you're doing it, you know, for for Smooth, who you know, I didn't even know he was still with the company. I know. Who wasn't even someone that's feuding with Canyon? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so let's see. Hunter Hearst Helmsley at 6 p.m. tonight. Oh, that's during our show. He's doing a USA Today online chat. Uh, let's see what else is uh, going on. Uh, we got some stuff I want to talk about about the ratings from Monday. Uh, after I, I, I actually didn't get all the breakdowns until Wednesdays. Actually, if you listen to the show Tuesday, you know that I didn't know. But um, the Vince Stephanie segment actually did the 5.6 quarter. Actually, it's 5.63, I think. I got it somewhere else. But anyway, um, so the main event was a 5.0, which is very low for a, ma for, for a main event, especially with Rock and Austin against Helmsley and Angle. That's really low. Um, but it, it, draw, it jumped from a 4.7 the previous quarter, not dropped from a 5.6, which at least makes sense. Uh, the thing on all this, and, and the real interesting thing about this, and this is about the Vince uh, Trish thing, um, it did a 5.6. Which is, which is much better than anything else on the show did. So in that sense, you can say it was a successful angle. However, it dropped. In fact, they lost 20% of their audience. They dropped 1.1 million viewers, tuned that show off after that angle ended, and never came back. Yeah. Um, now, did they really hate seeing the Hardys and the Dudleys, which was the, the next thing on the show for the tag team title, and they just didn't want to see it? Or did they... Um, or were they turned off by the angle and just said, that's it? You know, as a lot of people wrote into us and go, that's it. And if, that, and if the latter is the case, then that was a really, it's never a good angle when you uh, get 20% of your audience to, you know, tune it off. And the and other thing, it's not like WCW, which often has big ratings drops during the show because Raw is on and Raw has something hot and a lot of people switch channels. Raw, I mean, Nitro was already off the air, so these people were turning off wrestling completely. They weren't just going like, okay, Hardy, you know, we're, everyone's watching this angle, and then, like, some people go, or you go, okay, they're WCW fans, now they're going to switch back because the angle's over. I mean, they weren't, that's that's not the case. Mm -hmm. They turned the TV off. So, yeah. make of that what you will. Uh, let's see, Jim Rome on Tuesday did the last word on the XFL. You know, I mean, uh, what, what can I say? That may be the last word. I, I, based on everything, between the stock falling, I think there was an article in, uh, was it New York Daily News and New York Post the other day, about, um, you know, basically the, the, you know, so Wall Street analysts were saying you know, the stocks going to drop until they pretty much said they're done. And so they may be forced on that end. And just the quotes from Vince McMahon and from NBC from yesterday and the day before, really, I mean, no one's no one's going like, hey, we're we're with this and quit bugging us. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's the quotes are. It's like Vince's quote was, well, I mean, as long as NBC's in it, we're. Okay. In it. I think everyone wants to be. You know, wants the other one to say that they pulled out. So they. So you know what I mean? Yeah. But, the stock was it. Uh... Twelve dollars and forty cents, by the way. Last time I checked. Yeah, I heard that. So that's really bad. There's a lot of pressures for them to get out of this thing. Uh, let's see the. But on the Jim Rome thing, Lee, Lee the Hawk Rearman, former roller derby announcer, roller jam announcer, uh, talked about um, was trying to justify, you know, the ratings really aren't that bad, and you know it's like, <laughs> you know, I'm so sick of people. Okay, the ratings are bad. There is no justification for the ratings. Okay. It is true that the NBC game draws more viewers than a lot of other sporting events that are not held in prime time. But in the history of primetime television, which is 50 years and five zillion shows, I think there's only been one show in history that ever did a lower rating, or two, I take that back. There's two shows in history than last Saturday's XFL game. That is not good no matter how you slice it. And the third hour of that game actually did a lower hour than any hour of primetime of, of one of the four big networks 
in the history of television. Okay, so this is not good. The yeah. UPN rating was the third lowest rated show uh, of the week among any show on any network. Um, and the and those two shows that beat were both reruns. Okay, of uh, was it Gary and Mike? I think whatever some 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 show that obviously is, is doing really bad too. <laughs> the TNN game is doing um, roughly one third of what it was projected to do. That is not good. There is no justifying these numbers. No matter how anyone tries to do that. And I also don't want anyone to write me. Do not write me. Do not write me. Do not call and say, well, it's Saturday night and their demographic goes out on Saturday night because, one, they should, if that's the case, they should have known that before the season started. Two, there are um, several other networks that run on Saturday night, all of which do well over double of what NBC now does. NBC has had programming on Saturday night for the last 50 years, and they've never had ratings like this ever. And also, the XFL runs on Sunday night on UPN and draws half the audience, draws on Saturday night, so it's not the night of the week. Okay? Do I have to, do I have to, do I have to talk about your XFL ratings ever again? Yes, you will. Probably. Okay. Well. Just like Montreal. <laughs> oh, do you know how many emails we got in Montreal? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm kind of glad that uh, all the mail to the show goes to you, because I don't have to read these. Yeah. Actually, I don't mind the Montreal stuff um, at all. Um, we'll get to, we'll get we'll actually get to Montreal a little later. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Pro Wrestling Noah announced uh, the bracketing for their global championship. First round is two cold Scorpio against Kentaro Shiga, Yoshiro Takayama against Jun Izumita, Tamin Honda against Isuki Ikeda, Vader against Akira Tawe, Takao Mori versus Jun Akiyama, which will definitely be the best first round match. Takeshi Rikio against Takeshi Morishima, Yoshinori Ogawa against Misawa Noe, Mitsuharu Misawa against Akatoshi Saito. Looking at the way the bracketing set up, I think Vader's going to the finals almost for sure on one side, and then it'll be the, the winner of Misawa and Akiyama will be probably in one of the semifinals. So it'll be either Misawa or Akiyama against Vader, and I would figure the Japanese guy would win. But uh, we'll see. The tournament ends April the 15th, and on April the 14th, uh, Ricky Choshu and Toshiaki, not Ricky Choshu, Keiji Mudo and Toshiaki Kawada have their first ever Singles match at Budokan Hall, which is why the champion Carnival Final, which was originally scheduled for April 14th, has been moved to April the 11th. Uh, let me see. Waller, uh, Waller talked to Ed Kaufman, his WF attorney who handles contracts, and asked about his release, and Kaufman told him that Vincent Mann had never informed him to give Waller a release. Does that sound familiar? That sounds much like a uh, talk to Bret Hart had with Vincent Mann and the uh, people in the WWF. About tapes. About tapes. Um, Vince has a very uh, short memory when it regards uh, employees that have left. <laughs> I guess I guess so. Let me see what else we have here. A uh, real quick, uh, of course, SmackDown tonight. So I thought it was funny that someone named Kaufman broke this news to Lawler. Yeah, that's kind of cute. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, dude, we'll go, I'll go through the SmackDown stuff pretty quick. Um, for Heat on Sunday, uh, uh, let's see. The Ninja Girl gets unmasked as Tori. So that's in a Crash Holly Raven match. So maybe they'll do a mixed tag at WrestleMania. Maybe I don't know. Uh, let's see for SmackDown. What do we got? Uh, I mean, uh, let's see. Hardys and Dudleys. Hardys retained the title, and then uh, I think they uh, did something. To, didn't they do something to Christian after the match? Yeah, and, Christian, you know, Christian came out, and uh, Dudleys get him, gave him the headbutt to the groin, and then powerbomb to the table. Okay. Then uh, Benoit had to run the gauntlet. Which really sounds like a Paul Lee deal. Um, so he beat Perry Saturn, beat Dean Malenko, and then got pinned by Eddie Guerrero. Now I watched this on TV. I was told actually by by someone that they cheered Eddie Guerrero over Benoit, which got everyone all mad because this whole idea is to turn Benoit babyface. But there was something that was done uh, with Benoit and Eddie Guerrero beforehand involving a pull apart that clearly made Benoit the heel, and it was like the psychology was like all when you watch it, you'll see the psychology is all wrong and. No one can figure out why they did it that way. Other than it was the feeling that if they did it this way, it would make Benoit th that badass heel that becomes a baby face, but this time the people didn't respond the way they thought they would. So anyway. Yeah. It's kind of continue. interesting on Monday, too, because they kind of did the breakup, or they did do the breakup, and it was like... Oh, and clearly Benoit was the bad guy in it. Yeah, nobody <laughs> knew they, they were supposed to cheer him. It was like he gave the headbutt to Eddie, and then everyone's like, okay, well, are yeah. we supposed to cheer him now? Yeah, well, he did the heel thing. He screwed yeah. his partners. But I guess his partners are heels, so very confusing. But they're not strong heels. Uh, Jericho beat Val Venus. Uh, let me see. Vince, Linda, and Trish. Yes, you know, when this segment is over, uh, with Vince and, and Trish and Linda, 
Linda will get her revenge on Vince. But Trish is never going to. <laughs> <laughs> that is for sure. Yeah, Linda will get it. Don't worry. Vince, Vince will sell for Linda. But uh, anyway, so Linda's out there as a zombie while Vince and Trish are making out. So Trish has already forgiven Vince. Uh, Kurt Angle and Test, which was actually most uh, monumental for uh, Tony Schimmel or someone screwing up uh, because it was announced as a European title match. Oops. Kurt Angle won clean and was announced as a European champion. And then they made Tony Schimmel go out there and redo the, redo the ring announcing in front of the crowd going, this is a non-title match, and then explaining that because Kurt Angle won and it was a non-title match, the Test is still the champion. So on TV, as through the magic of uh, videotape and editing, nothing will probably look wrong. The WCW will probably still be wrong. You know, nothing incredible. Will look I was just thinking about this. Remember, I in fact there have been about a million different things. China coming out with a gun and it didn't go off. Uh, Tony Chimmel here screwing up. All this stuff, all this horrible stuff, always happens on SmackDown where they can edit it. And for some reason with WCW, it always happens on a live show. Yeah. Why is I know. that? God. Likes Vince McMahon. <laughs> Think about oh, that. I have no idea why. <laughs> Gotta find out why that is. Uh, see, Al or Snow Vince did really sell his soul to the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Al Snow against Regal for the commissionership, which, um, let's see, Regal wins. Uh, Al Snow is accompanied by midgets. Um, Regal uh, wins when Al Snow is distracted by an injured midget. <laughs> Uh, Regal then suplexes the another midget after the match. Uh, so anyway, and then uh, you know that's going to be awesome. Well, it'll be funny. Um, Helmsley does an interview, and the guy who comes out to confront him is the Undertaker. Uh. So it's not going to be Helmsley and Angle at WrestleMania. It looks like it's going to be Helmsley and Undertaker, unless they're doing this for Raw. Now what did I hear? I heard something for um. I heard a, I heard a match. Okay, Monday Monday on Raw. I think they're doing Ben 180 in a straight single. Which was in, which I thought was interesting because I thought that was the WrestleMania match, which makes people think they may do the four way radicals match at WrestleMania. Yeah, but um, I don't know where Angle fits in any. But you know that's one of those matches. I mean, like when WCW, I think they did it with who did they do it like Rick Steiner and Dustin Rhodes or something. What did they what? do? They've done a lot of things. They did like I don't a preview match about. for a pay per view, and the match ended up being really hideous. Oh, it was Rick Steiner and Shane Douglas. Just horrible. They, match. They, they, they do the pay per view matches on TV. Before the pay-per-view on almost every match, but yeah, Rick Steiner and Shane Douglas had that really bad match because remember when it was over, we didn't want to see it. But then yeah. I think Shane got hurt anyway, and they never did it in pay-per-view anyway. Yeah, but like in this example, Ben Juan Eddie, they're gonna go out there and have an awesome match, and if they're given a little bit of time and there's like a cheap finish, people will want to buy it. Well, they will not buy it because of it, but yeah. they will probably do a four-way. Yeah. So Helmsley and Undertaker. So anyway, he, that's not Shawn Michaels. No. In fact. I don't know. There's, there's, there seems to be no opening for Shawn Michaels. Who better show up pretty sooner? <laughs> I think they'll just have him show up at WrestleMania. Just make an appearance. Just that'll be his comeback. What an appearance? He's not going to wrestle. No, he's not going to wrestle. But he'll come out and do something. That'll be like the beginning. Whatever they would do on Raw, they'll just do on. Because remember, I, I remember like a couple years ago. I think maybe it was last year, two years ago. He, I think it was last year. He just did his big comeback and said it would not be WrestleMania without Shawn Michaels. So maybe that can be his uh, annual gig. Yeah, they just signed him to a new contract. I don't think they signed him for like one day a year. Well, he could do uh, nine months and then retire for three and then come back at WrestleMania every year. Yeah. So how is the Undertaker? It's going to be a test. Now, if he pulls a four-star match on Undertaker, got to give him a lot of credit, don't we? Uh, yeah. Well, he's an awesome worker, no matter what. I mean, I mean, there's no, you know, I mean, he, you know, there's there's other stuff we can say, but he's an awesome worker. Um. They seem to be building so much for Kane and Undertaker winning the titles or doing something, so that's kind of weird. What are they going to do with Kane? I, I don't know, but I was like going, charting this thing out. And it, was like, it was like odd man out, Kane against Kurt Angle or something. Yeah. Which I really didn't want to see, because I've seen that match too many times and it's never been good. Uh, Rikishi and Haku had a handicap match against The Rock, which The Rock won. They tried to do the stink face on Deborah, but Austin made the save. So that's that's that deal. Paul, uh, what did you think of Monday Night's Wrestling... This was a scary poll. Actually, it gets scarier by the week. Raw was better 46%. Nitro was better 7%. Didn't watch Raw 2%. Didn't watch Nitro 17%. Didn't watch Raw or Nitro 28%. Wow. And uh, this is, uh, what are your feelings about the XFL? A, still watch it and enjoy it. B, never watched it. That's you. C, stopped because there was not enough emphasis on the football or the football was bad. D, stopped uh, because there was not enough emphasis on non-football. 
that means that you know you didn't want the football and you wanted wrestling and they didn't do it. And E stopped because it was bad television. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. I was listening to your show this past Tuesday, and I heard you said something in reference to Jerry Lawler to the effect that if we see him back at WrestleMania, we'll know this was a work. After hearing that, I started to wonder, do you know if there's ever been an angle centered around April Fool's Day? I don't know. And it won't start this year. No. That's not a work, by the way. But anyway, that's another thing. Uh, let's see. If WCW did indeed release Crowbar, they indeed did. It's from Todd Martin. Uh, this is a really bad sign for what's to come when the fusion deal goes through with all the untalented over pushed, washed up clods that filled the roster, releasing a talented, charismatic, hardworking young guy like Crowbar so incredibly stupid that it literally amazes me that it happened. Now, why should it... it I don't disagree with that. And and I was, like, kind of thinking, you know, they're going to... The, the reality is they're going to cut guys that are hardworking because the hardworking guys are the ones they don't push. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to cut Kevin Nash no matter what. I don't know if they can, actually, or Luger, because of that mentality that they're the top stars. So we're going to have more like this than less. I was, you know, I, I, I can't say I'm surprised they hadn't used the guy on television. Is it good? You know, I mean, it's, it's a terrible sign to send to employees. But they've been sending that terrible sign for how long? Forever. At least they didn't cut him and keep Daphne. Yeah, at least they got rid of him first. This was Scott Keith. The other day you mentioned the incident when Hulk Hogan burned the Observer on pay-per-view. Out of curiosity, I went back and watched World War III to check it out. I'm left with a couple of questions. In that interview, Hogan said the rag sheet was saying the Giant was going to win. Of course, Savage win. Savage won. Did they change that just for you? The funny part was is that the rag sheet actually said that Savage was going to win, not that the Giant was going to win. <laughs> so they didn't change the finish. They um, changed the Observer. They changed what I said to make me wrong, even though I had it right, which is really <laughs> weird. Uh, really, actually, there's... There was so much weird stuff about that. Don't forget the Unless tricep he, with Savage. The tricep thing. Well, we'll talk about that in just a second if he doesn't. Okay, second. Savage went, won the match when Hogan eliminated 50 guys by himself. Then he went under the bottom ropes behind the referee's back. You'd think he could at least put his best friend over for once in his life, but that's Hogan. Anyway, Hogan threw a big temper tantrum, and the whole crowd completely turned on him, just like at Royal Rumble 92, which seemed to set up Savage and Hogan at Starcade to settle the issue. Instead, we had to settle for all this four-star match, ma matches and Flair winning the title back, and I'm... Pretty disappointed about that. So what happened there? Did someone ask Hogan to do a job at Star and took a month off to pout? I'm pretty sure that would have been a huge money match given how hot WCW was getting at the time. I don't remember the politics behind that. Um, but the thing on that that was the most hilarious of all was Randy Savage had torn his tricep a couple of weeks earlier. And he was still wrestling with a torn tricep because, you know, I mean, for better or for worse, that was his mentality. I'm in the middle of a big money run, and I'm not taking any time off. Um, and, you know, I could just fix it later, which evidently he did fix it with, and got up to about 260 pounds by fixing <laughs> the same way he fixed it. But, um, the, um, so, so anyway, Savage really did tear his tricep, okay? So Hogan goes in there and also just goes, you know, not only that, but we worked all the boys too. Randy, I mean, Randy Savage, he doesn't even have a torn tricep. Now, as, as this is going on, Randy Savage's one arm is half the size of the other. But he's explaining how this was just a work that me and him created on the boys to get into the newsletter. Okay? Now explain that. Okay? Now, 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 now except that he really did tear his tricep. Now, what made it even better was, in that show, there was a match with Lex Luger and Randy Savage, and the finish was Lex Luger beating Randy Savage with basically an armbar submission. That's right. With, them, with Tony Schiavone saying Savage had to give up because of his torn, torn tricep. tricep. So, so they actually did a finish based on that while in the beginning of the show saying that it was a work, even though the one arm is half the size of the other. And when it was over, I was thought, like, I mean, like, that night there were a couple of guys, and I guess I can mention Pillman's name since he's dead and he can't get in trouble for this. We were just, like, laughing so much because he just goes, Hogan's completely lost his mind. <laughs> he goes, what a fool him and Sting and Savage made of themselves. You know, like, first, they put you over on, this, on the show. Second, they kill their own um, finish of the match, and they make their announcers and their product out to be a work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Uh, anyway, that was very weird. Okay. Uh, one thing you should keep in mind before judging everyone in the Raw crowd during the Trish Vince thing is the mob or group mentality can be really strong and consuming. Absolutely true. That is true. Absolutely true. Yes, very valid. Uh, let's see. Uh, did they call Jason B and Scotty OBO at any time? No, I don't think they did. Okay. But I was thinking that. Yeah. Also, a few years back, I remember the interview where Hacksaw Duggan said, you remember this one, everyone remembers this. 
uh, where he said that Hulk Hogan was a great technical wrestler, but he's not a good fighter. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was that was a great interview. Actually, yes. compared to uh, Duggan, he may be a great technical wrestler. <laughs> hey, I remember he called him Terry. He, he and he called him Terry. He didn't call him Hulk. Yes. Was Terry, you may be a great technical wrestler, but you know, this is when he when Hogan turned on on uh, everyone. Um, this is from Sean, who goes, I've decided that I know absolutely nothing about wrestling. Why would they release Crowbar? Budgetary reasons, but anyway. A young guy like that can wrestle, and he can cut a promo, but a guy like Stasiak gets pushed, while a guy like Crowbar is, sits at home, and Rob Van Dam sits at home. Stasiak must go. If WF couldn't make him a star, why does WCW think they can do something with him? Because he's tall, and he has a good physique. Right? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. No, that's the reason. Do you have Thunder on tape? No. I... <sighs> Because I was supposed to be home in my plane, as as usual, my plane was delayed two hours. I was supposed to be home in time for the show, so I didn't bother asking anyone to tape it for me. And then I sat there at, uh, at LAX, sitting there and sitting there and sitting there, while you know, I don't know if I was in the north. You mean they weren't North. playing it on the TVs there in the airport? No, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Uh, the stock closed at twelve dollars and thirty-five cents, down ninety-four cents on the day. Uh, it was trading at 12.21 at one point, which is below its 52-week low finish of 12.25. Uh, since January, on January 31st of the year, it, it, it hit the $22 mark, so it's dropped 43% in five weeks. You know, the problem with the stock is it goes up and down and up and down, and the reality is once they dump the XFL, you know, like, if you figure out the day they're going to dump the XFL, you should buy the stock on that day. Oh, don't start this again. I know, because every time I do that, It'll we're always wrong. It'll plummet down to like $5 a share, and you'll get <laughs> I know. Threat. Okay, forget it. I'll never say this again. I've been hearing conflicting reports that Trish Stratus will not strip again. Um, it doesn't on the show tonight, I, because I personally hope not. Plus, how do you think the heel color guy for the Trish Vince segment should have reacted? I was talking about Heyman. I personally think they both should have acted like this is going too far. Uh, Heyman can't with his character. Heyman couldn't. And yeah, Lawler, especially Lawler certainly couldn't either. Uh, if Lawler was there, do you think that he would be screaming puppies or taking the angle like it was really serious? I think that he would be doing the same thing Heyman did. He goes, I personally think Lawler would have acted serious. You may be right, but I don't think so. Uh, let's see. This just says, for Brian, didn't you think Easy Money looked really good? Yeah, he wasn't bad at all. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Would you be surprised to see Lawler on WCW TV anytime soon? Um, not before they give him that release. <laughs> Uh, let's see, this is from Dennis. I've been thinking why Deborah would be thrown in the Rock Austin mix. Then it hit me. She will be the key to turn Austin heel. That's yeah, possible. It's possible. A lot of things. Yeah, but why, why set up a bunch of Hunter Austin matches if Austin's turning heel? Really? Maybe, maybe Hunter's going babyface? Yeah, they tried that before. Um, if Rock is out and Austin goes heel, Hunter can be top babyface. Actually, that's true. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, let's see. It seems that every time I watch Raw or Nitro, I always see a few blue and white striped flags in the audience. What is the significance of the flag? Uh, it's blue and white striped flag in the upper left-hand corner. What does this have to do with wrestling? I don't know. What, what is this? Blue and white in the corner of the screen? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I don't have that flag. Is there some heat between Helmsley and Jericho? What's clever about it is, is that there probably isn't. There should be. <laughs> if so, do you know the cause? Yes, they both have blonde, long hair, and Jericho came in with a big, big build-up in a lot of people's minds, and people thought that, that you know, Helmsley thought he wasn't as good as me and set out to prove it. And he may not be, but he still killed him, even if he was. Uh, let's see. Of the two dumb Mets and versus Juice and a guy with hair matches, which one do you think was better? God damn, those are 15 years ago. The one that Chagusa Nagayo lost was the better of the two. Okay? The one that she won was so unbelievably bloody. So if you like blood, that was the better of the two. But for wrestling, the one that she lost would be the better. Uh, let's see. What was Vince Russo's role in Survivor Series 1997? I believe in past interviews he said he, had, said he had nothing to do with it. But there are two reasons I can't see why he was not a part of it. One... He's obsessed with reliving the finish in WCW2 with his huge ego. I can't see him not wanting to be part of the writing team for one of the most anticipated main events ever. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about this one. First of all, Vince Russo, after the fact, claimed that the Wednesday before 
that he and Vince were talking at Vince's house, and Vince told him ahead of time that, that Vince was doing it. Now, in WCW, he tried to claim that he did it, you know, as a heat-seeking mechanism, you know, to confuse all the fans or whatever that whatever the reasons were. He wanted to take credit for it to get himself over, obviously. But but he has said in interviews that he was aware of it on the Wednesday before uh, because Vince and him discussed it. What was interesting about that, if that is in fact true, and I don't know that it is true, is that Vince told everyone else that he decided to do it on the day of the event because when he and Bret Hart had that discussion, Bret Hart refused to do business, he refused to do the job and all that. Now, of course, if you ever read the transcript, because Bret Hart actually was wired, um, Vince McMahon never asked him once the whole day of that show to lose to Shawn Michaels. Now, he did ask him weeks before. He would asked him earlier in the week a couple of times. But that day, he never asked him once. Yet, he went to the boys on Monday in, uh, what was it, Ottawa, when he gave the big speech with the black eye, saying he took one for the boys, and Brett was going to appear on Nitro that night, which was a total lie. Although, it was a total lie. What am I, how am I trying to justify Vince? It was a total lie. Okay, um, and that... Um, that, that Brett had refused to do business, he had refused to drop the title, which is all not true, and that, you know, he had, re you know, he had been totally unprofessional in that conversation, which if you read the conversation, uh, there was no sign of unprofessionalness, and, you know, refused when Vince asked him to lose the title, which Vince never asked him to do. But anyway, so if, if he had told everyone that the reason he made that decision to screw Bret Hart was done on that day because of a conversation that him and Brett had, which he made up what was in that conversation, okay, then how would he have told Vince Russo the Wednesday before that story? Other than Vince Russo may be telling the truth. And I think, I don't believe that Vince set it up that day, because it was too well planned Yeah. to have just come down that day. All right. On Tuesday's show, you said that Ross and Heyman had never worked together. Um, I think I meant in WWF, obviously. You know, it goes without saying that they worked together for years in WCW. Uh, the latest edition of the WF's Raw magazine has a sidebar on the British gambling company putting odds on who will be the WF champion on December 31st. <laughs> That's really scary. Uh, let's see. The WrestleMania book's out. And, by the way, Hunter's on the cover, by the way. Did you know that? That is surprising. Yeah. Hunter, yeah so, anyway, uh, it's from Hector Ruiz. He goes, I've come to the conclusion that Lawler is doing the power play right now and will be returning to the WWF. He posted two huge feedback sections on his website. And I'm not bragging or anything, but my letter was better than 90% of the ones he posted. <laughs> the reason he didn't post mine was that I wished he wouldn't come back to the WWF because Vince will think he's gullible and will have total control over him. He also mentioned the XFL in a statement and did not bury the product in any way. The only thing he criticized in his website about the WWF is the fact he got fired, and that could mean it is only a work, which I don't think it is, or that Lawler is planning a return. Well, here's the reality. This is the reality. If he doesn't get his release, he pretty much has to come back. Because there's only two places, or, or get out of wrestling, yeah. which I don't think is what he wants to do. So he's not going to go out there and, and, and dig a hole any deeper. Um, then he has to. And I think he's, you know, he's not a dumb guy, and I think he realizes the situation. Uh, let's see. When you talked about Bret Hart and that his book would be honest, I came to thinking about Roddy Piper's book. Wouldn't you think that he would be as honest as Bret Hart? I think that he'll be... I think because of a lack of uh, uh, detailed notes, it might be a little less factual. Um, and also the difference between other people. Reasons. There's other reasons, too. I don't think that, I don't think that Roddy Piper will, will be dishonest in his book. But I don't. I, I, I don't get not reading dishonest. intentionally. Exactly. But you know, the, the one the, the thing with Bret Hart and why Bret Hart's book will be more accurate than any other book is because he kept detailed notes for twenty years, and and he's going to know what happened on what day for real rather than kind of guess and be off by a year or something like that. Because you know, if you don't have notes in front of you, I mean, I can remember stuff, but my memory's not perfect from twenty years ago either. Will Roddy Piper ever be on Wrestling Observer Live? You we were saying no. Much trouble. We would get in too much trouble. Never say never, but I certainly do not expect it. Uh, let's see. I'll read this one, and then we'll head to a break. Uh, I was wondering what you and Brian thought were the all-time classic wrestling screw-ups. I had two in mind. These were good ones, too. My favorite was during a WWF free-for-all. For the first senior house pay-per-view, Jim Ross was interviewing Sid. Sid stumbled over his lines and asked if they could retake the interview. I would just say that one. <laughs> yeah. It was like to me, Gene. It was something like, just like out of nowhere, he goes, Excuse me, can I please do that again? Or just totally polite. And it goes, JR oh, paused and goes, we're live, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> the look that on Sid's good. face was priceless. My personal favorite was screw-up was during Steve McMichael's first match as a member of the Horseman on Nitro. He was wrestling a six-man tag. The Renegade was on the top rope to do a maneuver. 
Mongo threw his briefcase from the outside, which was supposed to hit Renegade. It missed him by at least two feet. Renegade sold it anyway and got pinned. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. You know, uh, another funny uh, screw-up. Remember, uh, actually the whole match was a screw-up, but uh, the second Hogan Warrior, the throwing fire spot. Oh, yeah, of course. Yep. Same with Paul oh, Bear and Undertaker as as... when they tried to throw fire. Who won Undertaker? Remember Paul Bear and Undertaker were going to do the... Uh... I can't remember what there they was... were going to do. Something screwed up, and I think he... Uh... What happened there? Someone can write. I think he's going to try and throw fire or something like that, and it didn't work. And then he had thrown like this giant fireball, and they did the whole Paul Bear thing where he taped his face up. I can't remember what the deal was, but it was a screw up. They did a bully. Yeah, there was a thing. Well, let me think about this. It was on Cornette's television, not all that long ago, because it involved the Big Show and Sin, where she was supposed to throw a fireball. And I mean, this was the most screwed up. This was Hogan Warrior level. And and it just, like, totally screwed up. And Big Show's selling it anyway, and everyone's just groaning. And Cornette, I guess because of the nature of their product, um, even though they're, they're on tape, I guess they do live to tape or something, and they can't edit because it aired, right? Yeah. So then they taped another segment, like, you know, ten minutes later, where they're backstage, and she throws another fireball at him. And it didn't really miss by as much. It still looked bad, but it was... It was more passable, and, and he sold it again. And the second one, like, they explain how the first one missed, but the second one hit. Even though he sold the first one. Poor, poor Big Show, and none of that was his fault. I mean, he was just standing there, and it's like, he's, he's a big target. He shouldn't be, you know. <laughs> I know, it's hard you know. to miss. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, uh, just... this wasn't one of the funniest ever, and uh, actually words cannot even uh, do justice to how funny this was, but it was Dallas Page and Machine on Thunder. When uh, Page crotched the rope, or Page hit the rope, and Machine was supposed to crotch it on the top rope. And so I remember crotching, this. He actually jumped like three quarters of the way across the ring to crotch the top rope, and uh, is the most oversold move I've ever seen on Thunder. And that's saying a lot. This is uh, Taz was officially announced as the permanent co-host on SmackDown. So uh, they're claiming that this is in response. To, <laughs> Brian, this is funny. This is in response to the internet campaign for Taz to get more exposure. WF.com is saying now he has three hours of exposure more than any other wrestler in the whole company, so we listen to you. That's what you guys get for your campaign. <laughs> That's right. I don't want to hear about him being underused. Uh, let's see. Um, did they offer Easy Money a contract? I haven't heard. This says that they released Crowbar and they offered Easy Money a contract. Hmm. So how can they release Crowbar to cut costs but then sign someone? They can balance it out. I mean, yeah, Bischoff explained the whole thing on the show that if they cut someone, they can... So maybe they cut him because, you know... You know, if they cut Kevin Nash, which they actually can't do, so this is really unfair for me to say this. Okay, but if they cut Lex Luger, they probably can do that at some point. They could sign, like, 500 easy monies. Oh, yeah. Or maybe not 500. Um, they could sign... Let's see. Let's think about this. They could sign... 11 or 12 easy monies with one Lex Luger and they would have like so many more better matches from 12 of those guys than one of him uh, let's see uh, do you think a guy has to have a big run as a heel because he can have a big run on top as a face history seems to indicate this um I think someone could be a top face without without going heel first today I think it's possible Goldberg yeah okay there it is yeah okay, Goldberg get it that's only a couple years ago. ECW has officially canceled its pay-per-view on Sunday. Oh, my God, really? <laughs> but they, um... But I thought that they were still running commercial. Oh, 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 oh. A lawyer? Okay, Bill Custers, this is the director of marketing for Viewer's Choice Canada, uh, called Slam Today, okay? Now, see, Bill Custers was actually informed by people two weeks ago that there would be no pay-per-view. It was just not from, from ECW. And he already had the plan that they were going to do a best of on Sunday. But anyway, he said that a lawyer from ECW called his counterpart in the United States. So that would mean they would call in demand today and said Sunday's event is, in fact, canceled. <laughs> but ECW, anyway, that's nice. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm curious if TSN aired the Trish Vince thing. No, they did not. They edited it out. Uh, let's see. About the fast count, Earl Hebner didn't lie. He didn't fast count him. He called for the bell and said Brett gave up. Did That's Earl write same. this letter? What? Did Earl write this letter? That was Earl's big defense this whole time. That's like so went. That's so lame. Uh, let's see. I want to make mention of the Trish and Vince segment. Get over it. It was awesome. It was a change of pace. Not everything has to be a wrestling match. By the way, have we ever suggested once that everything has to be a wrestling match? Apparently we have because uh, 
I get those emails every now and then. Okay, if that were the case, wrestling would not draw. And everyone has to be a junior heavyweight. Yeah, we've never suggested that either. Then he says, ECW, anyone who has a problem with that segment, get over it. Okay, um, what about those 1.1 million people who turn their television set off? They need to get over it. Okay, anyway, Chris in California. Chris, what's going on? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing pretty good. I have a couple questions for you real quick. Yes. Now, on uh, the future of Kobashi, how do you think it's going? Not good. Um, I mean, he probably, you know, realistically, he should never wrestle again. Obviously, he will. Obviously, he'll come back too soon. Obviously, he's going to be under the knife again next year because mm -hmm. of that. If it's not good. I mean, he's, it's just, it's really sad about those guys. You know, they all had so many great matches, and, and all of them are just breaking down. Yeah. I think the uh, decade of the 90s was pretty much Kobashi, Kawada, and Masawa. Yeah, and then the decade of 2000, they're all paying for it. You know, I think that's what makes Flair... Among all of those guys that we talk about as the greats, maybe the best of all is that, like, you know, um, Bret Hart pretty much broke down. Um, Michaels totally broke down at the age of, like, 33. Kobashi broke down, you know, like, 31. Flair was still going strong, you know, well into his mid-40s. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not off. saying, like, like I, I'm not saying, like, Flair at his peak, was I, I would say, was not as good as Michaels on his best day. He was definitely not as good as Kobashi or Kawada on their best day. But the bottom line is, is that he lasted. You know, he was doing 300 nights a year, which none of them were ever doing, with that many good matches, and he outlasted all of them. So that says something. Because I remember when I was, you know, I used to think that you know Kobashi's the guy who's going to be better than Flair, you know, in the long run. But you know, I mean, his career was over too early. Although, you know, I shouldn't say it's over because I know he'll come back and he'll probably even have great matches. But I mean, when he when he came back this last time, watching him try to wrestle, and he has still had great matches. It was just sure. so painful to to see him like. You could watch those knees just like buckle every step. Yeah, that's pretty sad. And I mean, I mean, there's, I think there's just some guys like Flair that they just don't break. I mean, he had the rotator cuff problem and everything like that, but he always wore like his knee pads down actually below his knees, and uh, always taking the backdrops, always doing the. Uh, you know, Ray was talking about he can't, you know, like do a double sledge off the top and land on his feet and stuff like that. Flair always came off the top doing that. Well, I guess he didn't know he got caught, but still. Didn't yeah. fall apart. May Young. May Young, yeah, what a phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, any other woman that age would have been broken in two many times over. Mm hmm Yeah, it's pretty outstanding how he had that endurance just to go through those matches as well. I mean, yeah. for Flair, his body didn't look that great, but he was he was still huffing and puffing. He had a lot of gas to go compared to the other. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's right. He was doing those 60-minute matches, and they were not slow-paced matches. Yeah. And, and, and it's right, I mean, he was doing longer matches than all those guys we talked about. Although they worked, you know, I don't want to fault them, they worked super intense matches too. Um, I mean, Kobashi and those guys, uh, I mean, even more than Michaels, way more than Michaels, quite frankly. Uh, I mean, they worked really, really physically hard uh, matches, actually physically harder matches than Flair did, really. I mean, as far as just physical punishment, and that's, you know, that's part of it. True, and I heard something about the lines then starting to pro wrestling camp or something is there anything true to that yeah they're doing um the, yeah, the san diego one i mean not 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 the other ones but the san diego one that, that ken shamrock is running is um in fact he'll be on the show and we'll probably talk about that but yeah they're going to do some pro wrestling training i think oh, maybe really? um do you know when he's yeah. going to be on the show friday a week from friday a week from friday i'm going to have to yeah. write that one down got a couple yeah. questions so when is this big fight with igor uh the 25th and it'll 25th. air on pay-per-view on april 6th sounds great Okay. Will the U.S. ever get that pay-per-view? Yeah, April 6th in the U.S. If you got a dish. I mean, uh, not, if you don't have a dish, you're not going to be able to get it. But um, it'll air in Japan live on pay-per-view. True. True, true. Well, I appreciate it. Okay, you're very welcome. Let's go to Mark in Connecticut. Mark, what's up? Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are we today? Hey, hey we're doing really good. Good, good, good. Um, my little uh, quotable of the day, everybody uh, gets on uh, Sid Udy's case for taking time off to play softball. Well, uh seems to me that Rick Steiner only returned to WCW when hunting season was over and Wade Bog went to work big league camp with the Devil Rays. <laughs> I, mean, you know, just, I, I think it just has more to do with Eric Bischoff being back in power. Yeah, probably, but, you know, with, the, with these uh, things, there's probably more than the kernel of truth. I mean, a guy can get a million dollars for uh, working when he wants and how he wants. You know, anything's possible. Um, I want to, you know, just bring something up to you. I don't know if you happen to see it. Probably you don't have time to check uh, Keller's website, but... Uh, they put a uh, archive up uh, of one of uh, Bruce Mitchell's columns from 1991, um, and it was before I uh, I had started reading the Torch. And uh, 
He made made mention of the fact of uh, your run with the National and uh, your uh, you know your running with uh, Titan and uh, how Frank DeFord stepped in and uh, you know kind of you know defended you, which I thought was really uh, really good. My my question or the thing I wanted to just discuss is uh, the whole problem with uh, with Titan. I guess you had in 1990. Mitchell alludes to it, but never really makes it definite what it is. Uh, you know, and then uh, it, it led to the point where where uh, SI did an article in '91 and Titan. Uh, Said, don't talk to Meltzer. He just writes a little industry newsletter, and he's got a hard on for McMahon. Any, uh, you know, can you give me any background into what that was all about? I remember reading your column in the National, but I don't remember anything real. Um, it was it was over um, it was over the Gulf War, and um, what happened was I had written a column critical. It was funny because I had, right before the Gulf War started, like literally days before, I had talked with J.J. Dillon. Who I just talked with, who was, was like Vince's number two or three guy, and I go, you know, if that war starts, you know, you better get off this angle type of a th- type of a thing. And he was going, I know, you know, we know that. And the war started, and in fact, they they hit it harder. And so I criticized them for basically exploiting the war, which clearly they were doing to build up that WrestleMania. Not oh, that they exactly. weren't the, not that they weren't the only ones, but uh, I mean, even Sports Illustrated themselves, when they were listing people who were exploiting the war, they actually said that the WWF did it more than any any other any other any other industry. But anyway, so I was critical of what they were doing and Hogan going to military bases to, for footage to act like he was this big patriot and things like that. And it was just like I thought it was kind of exploiting, you know, explaining the war to too big of a degree. You know, and and uh, they blew a gasket. I mean, big time. They big time blew a gasket. It just goes to show the arrogance of McMahon that he thinks that he would have any pull with the national publication, and Frank DeFord especially, you know, to think that they could pressure that. I mean, what was... Well, they, 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 pulled, they pulled all advertising out of the paper... Um, basically, they basically did a thing where they were going to pull all their advertising out um, unless How the national dumped me, which they didn't. Which they didn't dump me. They weren't doing a tremendous amount. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, I think that the Connecticut office actually wasn't doing any, but I think that um, that they were in some of the local. Mar- they were doing some local market advertising, but the Bodybuilding Federation pulled up. Was actually, I think, maybe doing more because I remember um, whoever it was that was running the Bodybuilding Federation wrote a really nasty letter to Frank DeFord about me at that point. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, we, you know, that's that's kind of like where everything it, where everything went, you it's know. A and, and I mean, it, it, it ended up with the they ended up where it got where it got really bad. Um, in a sense, was that you know I, I kept writing the wrestling column, but they wanted to do another a big a bigger story actually on the exploiting the uh, Persian Gulf War. Um, and it's funny that that the uh, the there was an so they had one of their other writers do the story because it was like basically McMahon talked to DeFord for a long time and McMahon was like, um, you know, I'll talk to any one of your reporters, but I will not talk to Dave Meltzer. So DeFord just goes, we're going to do a big story and we're going to talk to another reporter. And I was like really mad because I'm just going like, look, Vince should not be dictating, um, you know, who covers Vince for this paper, especially since it was my beat. Yeah. And he just goes, don't worry, it's going to work out fine. So it ends up with the reporter. Did a story that was just you know like very very critical of Vince, and so Vince just thought it was like so that's when Vince like blew a gas because because he couldn't blame it on me anymore because the other reporter who had no knowledge of any of this walked into this you know was given no guidelines of how to approach it and actually and actually wrote the same you know same basic story I probably would have ended up writing anyway yeah so I realized you know DeFord actually handled it the smart way and it was good to get you know it, it took me out it, it took it away from. The big thing that they try to do, and this is what Vince has, did with uh, Mushnick and with Bozell, um, to a to a different degree. Although those guys, those guys kind of fell for it a lot worse than I did. Yeah. Was try to turn a real issue, which was is he exploiting the Persian Gulf War or not, and make it Dave Meltzer versus Vince McMahon feud. And DeFord saw it coming and just goes, you know, like you are not feuding with Vince McMahon, and make sure that you don't do and don't fall into this trap, and we'll have somebody else write the story. And it was really the best for for everyone. And then Vince really blew a gasket when it was over because, you know, it wasn't me writing it, and you couldn't say, "Aha!" It was, you know, it was. It's all Dave Meltzer, and nobody else thinks that way because by this point, Sports Illustrated columnists all over the country were ripping him to death, not just me. So, you know, the, the, the Ford beat him in his own game. I guess it proved that Vince is not the smartest man alive. Um, well, he's not the alive, smartest man alive. He's just the best. He's just the best wrestling promoter. No, this is he was never. I don't think anyone ever considered him the smartest no, I'm, man. No, but alive. I'm sure he considers himself deep down. With that, he's um, yeah, yeah, because yeah, well, you got to remember, he's got people telling him what a genius he is all the time. So you know, you just, you, you start believing it. That's right. And that's that's part of the whole problem with the XFL, I think, is that you know, I think he wasn't, 
Let's, he wasn't. Let's, let's he, not go I'm there. sure I he could stay here another 45 minutes and talk about that. But uh, yeah, I mean, we all know that when Vince went in, I mean, he was he thought he was outsmarting everyone, and that you know, I mean, that no one knew anything about about marketing, and that that's why Vince is going to. There was no there was no question in his mind when this thing started that that thing was going to be a success. No, exactly. And um, you know, so Brian, just one quick question, and I'll, I'll, I'll get off. Um, I see all the stuff of your work up in the uh, Pacific Northwest region. What was the best match you ever had personally, and uh, on which one of your tapes might I find it? I think it's um, one of my favorites is a match I had with this kid named Trelane that went up to Calgary to be a mat rat, and I've never seen him since. <laughs> and that's on the uh, new tape. And for those of you interested in tapes, I think it's in the features section right now. There's a uh, thing I put up on Saturday about my new tape, so you can check that out at the website. Cool. All right, thanks for taking my call, guys. Good luck. Good afternoon. Bye-bye now. Uh, this is from Ed, who's going. You were talking about powerlifting and Scott Steiner. Um, by the way, I, I want to make this very clear as far as Steiner. I know he is super, super strong. Oh, yeah. I just, don't know that, I just don't know that he can do a bench press of like 670 pounds or 640 pounds, whatever was in that Muscle Magazine article, or that he's 32 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, who are or were actual strong men in wrestling, and what were the lifts that you know to be a factor as close to a fact as possible? Well, I mean, you got to look at the ones who have actually done it in competition where there's actually records. Um, Bill Kazmaier was one of the strongest men who ever lived. In fact, there are people who believe that Bill Kazmaier was the strongest man who ever lived. He wasn't much of a wrestler, though, but he did wrestle. Uh, Doug Furness held, I think it was 30, 31 world records by the time he was done in powerlifting. Super, super strong. Um, although D Doug Furness, the one thing with Doug Furness was is that he, he had a construction, you know, because of the sh relatively short arms and legs, he had better leverage than, say, a tall guy would have yeah. as far as power lifting. I think that realistically, you know, and I said, you know, he, I, I think that there are guys that were probably really physically stronger than Doug Furness, although obviously if you squat 980 pounds and bench six in competition, um, <laughs> you're strong you're as hell. <laughs> I don't care how short your arms are. And his arms weren't that short. And his legs weren't that short either. They looked short because they were just so darn so huge at his peak. Uh, but... Um, you know, I think that there probably were stronger guys than Doug Furness, uh, but he did have some biomechanical advantages. Uh, but he was pretty damn strong. Um, M.I. Smooth did a 600 bench press in competition, which is really good. Scott Norton's done a 640 bench in competition. Tony Atlas was a great bench presser, although he was not a great power lifter. Like Scott Norton's got like the perfect body for that, too. Just the bench press? gigantic torso and the short arms. Yep, yep, yep. But still, 640 in nice. competition? I mean, he probably could do 675, like, you know, like, cheating a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, competition bench is really hard. You know, with the pause at the bottom? Yeah. That's a, that's a bitch. Well, anyway, uh, let's see. There was an article. Mark Henry's super strong. I mean, you know, I mean, he didn't, like, when he, he wasn't... You see, what Mark Henry can make a claim to being one of the strongest men who ever lived is that if you took uh, every man in history and combined their... Powerlifting totals, which would be bench press, squat, and deadlift, and their Olympic lifting totals, which would be um, snatch and clean and jerk, and add those numbers up. Mark Henry would be the strongest man who ever lived because he was the only person that I'm aware of who was he was very close to world class in Olympic lifting and actually went to the Olympics, although he didn't do well there, and was also very close to world class. In fact, he won he's won some world meets in powerlifting, whereas most of the other guys that we're talking about, like Doug Furness, obviously Bill Kazmaier never did Olympic lifting. Ken Patera, who was super strong in Olympic lifting, it was also uh, physically Ken Patera was one of the strongest men who ever lived. I don't think there's any question of that. It is prime strength, early 70s. But Ken Patera was never in competition in powerlifting, although had he been in, because he did all those lifts, uh, he would have been uh, close to world class in powerlifting as well. Ken Patera is one of the strongest men who ever lived for his era. I shouldn't say ever lived, but in his era. I mean, he probably was the strongest man alive in his era because... Alexiev couldn't. I, I I would seriously doubt could have power lifted, you know, squat and and uh, deadlifted and benched what Patera could do. Although we don't know it because you know he never competed at it. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Anderson um, was the strongest man of his era, and he was a pro wrestler, although also not a very good one. So those are some that you know. There was a an article in one of the muscle magazines of like listing the strongest men who ever lived. They had Bruno Sammartino's name in there as as one of the strongest men who ever lived, and Bruno's. Um, I mean, Bruno did a 565 bench, but you got to realize that he did that with no steroids yeah. and with no bench and with, and without like one of those bench shirts. And I don't know how much a bench shirt adds to your bench, but it's probably significant. Mm -hmm. And steroids, you know, if he could do steroids in a bench shirt, I mean, it, I don't think it'd be an exaggeration to say 
Uh, you know, he might have been able to get up to 700. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it's, it's a big difference. Hackenschmidt? For his era, yeah, Hackenschmidt was considered the strongest man in the world in his era. I mean, but his lifts, I mean, you know, 300 press over his head and everything aren't, like, phenomenal by today's standards, but he did, like, you know, those strong men did those weird lifts, like yeah, one-arm like, presses and stuff? Yeah. And one-arm deadlifts and stuff that, like, you know, nobody today could do because no one does them. Don't forget Hackenschmidt the one like a squad. What? <laughs> that was one of my favorite moments on this show. When I was, ta when I was talking to you about the one-legged squad, and yes. it totally went over your head for about two minutes. Okay. <laughs> finally realized, how the hell do you do one-legged squat? Lunge? In the old days. I don't know. I, I used to do one-legged squats. <laughs> Not with any weight, though. <laughs> yes. That's hard on your knees, one-legged squats. Uh, let's see. What do we have here? Let's go Let's go to Tom in California. Tom, what's going on? Hey, how you guys doing? Hey. I have a question about the uh, economic situation of the WWF. Like, how long did it take for the WBF to be stopped, and how much did that affect their uh, money-wise so far? WBF was never the kind of expense the XFL is. How, what did WBF go? About, uh, one? They did the years. first... Probably, pay probably, probably two and a half years? I think they did two pay-per-views, right? No, they did two contests, but only the second one was on. The first one wasn't on pay-per-view, the second one was. Okay. So they were there, um, I would say probably two to two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Uh But, again, like... Their total losses were probably, you know, maybe five, ten million. It wasn't like, you know, it was ninety million or, you know, although WF is not going to lose ninety million on the XFL because they got NBC as a partner. Of course, they weren't making then what they were making now. Yeah, you're right. Close. Those kind of losses meant a lot more then than they do now. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Well, like today on the news, they were reporting that Vince wants out and he wants to leave NBC with the whole XFL by itself. Now, how will that? <laughs> how will that, how will that, that won't work? happen. They'll, they'll, they want out. They, those affiliates want out as bad as everyone wants out. They're just trying to figure out a way to get out on, but, and save face. I put on Fox News today, right before I watched your, listened to your show. So that, I don't know. What, you know I, I saw Vince's quote. I saw Vince's save quote. Face. How can you possibly save face? There's no way. Yeah. yeah. Can there really I mean, be I, any way to even remotely yeah. save face? Yeah. I mean, the things. I, th I think we all know the thing's done. Yeah. How much money yeah. will we lose on it? Do you think? Uh, if they go through the season. I think Vince is going to end up losing about $45 million and NBC is going to lose about $45 million. Maybe a little more. Because if they actually announce that it's done beforehand to save the price of the stock, the ratings will really plummet. I mean, don't, don't you think, Brian, that they're going to drop even more if they announce it's finished? Because then everyone knows there's nothing to look forward to. I think if they announce it's finished, they just got to end it. Um, not even finish the season? No, just end it. Oh. Or if you put yeah. Saturday Night Live in there or something. Anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, the ratings are so low, NBC could... Put a test pattern in and probably do the same number, right? Yeah. Actually, increase it according to what they used to think. <laughs> <laughs> the old, the old standards of ratings, three from three weeks ago. And my next question is: Have you got a copy of that new WrestleMania history book? No, I don't. I just had a great idea. That's bad. The football field. It's, it's, he said it's sad. Oh no. It is. You mean I'm going to have to write, read that book and then like write a whole observer about all the mistakes in the book? The WrestleMania history? Yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. I paid 50 bucks and I expected to see all these neat 50? stories. And $50? It's, yeah. it's listed at like close to 50 I saw the price tag on the thing. Tell, tell me about the book. Well, it basically book. says stuff that I already, already knew and it's basically for new fans. And so you really won't get too much out of it. Plus it comes with a DVD and it's really not too good. I mean, what uh, kind of, I mean, like as far as, as I mean, do they, do they lie or do yeah. they just not tell... They, yeah, they, they lie? It. Yeah, they lie. They well, 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 like, like, give me some examples. Well, like, you know, they still claim it's 93,000 people were at WrestleMania 3. The, well, I knew uh, they would do that. They have to do that. <laughs> well, they, they claim WrestleMania 9 was, like, a big success. and that about Which, one, which one was that? Hogan. Brett and Yokozuna with Hogan coming back. Oh, in Vegas? Oh, that, that show sucked. And he really trashed and they, tra they, tra they trashed Hogan in the book? Yeah. Like, in, in what Hogan. sense? Well, they were talking about how he, they didn't, how Hogan was a, a bad champion and he didn't, you know, pass it to Bret Hart. He was supposed to WrestleMania Nine, and how he was. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. WrestleMania Nine was booked for Hogan to to win, and then he was supposed to pass it later. He was never supposed to lose to Bret Hart at WrestleMania Nine. Bret Hart was already champion, and that was never it was never set up for that. Mm -hmm. That's what's in the book. Oh God, they're just. I mean, it's, no. it's not. That I'm going to get him. Mine's on sale on eBay right now. If anybody wants to buy it, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to write an Observer article about Basil DeVito. Basil's working so hard in the XFL that it's making up wrestling history, I guess. Oh, well. All right, thanks for taking the, the, my call. The, 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 the ghostwriter on that thing uh, is the same guy who ghostwrote the Rocks book, so oh, what does really? that say? Yeah, Joe, Joe Layden. 
Is he the one who, no, who just wrote just wrote China's book? Who did? Yeah. Oh, uh, I have it right here in front of me. Someday we should do a a, a uh, contest, and I can give away my copy of this book. <laughs> 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 the uh, I don't even know if it lit. Oh, with Michael Angeli. Okay, I don't know him. You know what's funny is that there's guys like Keith Greenberg that have been around from the beginning, and actually know this, who who and and have worked with for the WWF since the beginning, that are wrestling fans and and know wrestling history. Mm -hmm. That should have been like the the ghost writers for like the, these books, but instead they get these outside people who know nothing about wrestling. And and they end up writing crummy nothing, books. Nothing, nothing about writing, especially China's book. And, and rocks. I mean, my God. You know, I was uh, I was at uh, last night. Well, I was actually waiting for the plane to take off. I I went into the bookstore at the airport, and the paperback of Rock's book was out. The new additional you know what the new additional chapter is in Rock's paperback. A whole no. bunch of photos. There's no new edition. It says with <laughs> additional stuff, and it's all pictures of you know. And, it's, and the book ends the same way. There's nothing new, other than and I'm reading this book, and like the thing that. I remember it from the first time, and it's there like on one of the very first pages. I'm just kind of leafing through, going like, is this book really as bad as I remember it? And then I just see, in Rock's book, his grandmother's name is misspelled. I mean, in his own, I mean, yep. at least in China's book, there were these people like Terry Runnels. Shawn Michaels. Okay, you're right. Shawn Michaels is actually one of her few friends. But that, it's not as good, but it's still, it's not, it's not like it was her grandmother. Yeah. So, anything else, Tom? Tom's gone. Tom's gone. I gotta tell you okay. my idea for the XFL to save it. Okay. All right. The field needs to be redesigned to be a test pattern. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll get to a 3.0, right? Yeah. Instead of the green and white or whatever color the field is. Yeah. This is for Brian. I don't know why it's for Brian and not me, but it says tell Brian because um, because I have never been married either. He goes. This is from someone who said his name is married ten years. Tell Brian married couples have no electricity after the first year. What you saw between Steve and the human Barbie doll is called lust. After the first year, anything other than screaming at each other is known as lust. Okay, now... They haven't been married the, a year yet. No, they haven't been married a year yet. I was going to say that. And I don't know that that's true, but again, married people will have to say that. I don't know. Uh, let's see. I was at SmackDown. It was a very poor quality show. There were numerous screw-ups in production. The quality of the matches were pretty bad. Well, I guess we'll see tonight. The only match that was good was Benoit going through the radicals gauntlet. It was fabulous to someone who cares about his profession. The segment with Trish and Vince kissing in front of Linda was one of the most pathetic displays I've ever seen. It made me sick, but this is where the product is going when you have great wrestlers that can't even get a match on TV. Also, is it just me or is Steve Regal phenomenal? It is not just you. He is. Uh, I think he is the second best interview in the company. Certainly as a worker, he's right near the top. Best interview in the company. He is, as far as inter... I think he's... Oh, God. I don't know. Who would say the best interview in the company right now? I mean, Rock for delivery, but I, I, my favorite has always been Foley. Yeah. Do you count him as being in the WWF right now, though? Mm, I guess you could sort of not. I would almost pick uh, Regal or Angle. Angle, yeah. Because, I mean, sometimes Hunter will come out and whenever... It's too long. I mean, there are times when Hunter's talking when I'll get bored, and there's times when Rock is talking when it's like, okay, great, yes, I smell you, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Angle, I never, I never go. Oh man, this guy's talking. Actually, I think I have a couple of times, but usually, you know, I can listen to an entire Angle interview and it's good. And Regal, I have never been bored with a Regal interview. So, maybe but, Regal. but okay, but he has never been in a position like Angle and Hunter and Rock, where he's got to carry a segment by himself. That's true. Regal's stuff is interplay. Regal is more. I think Regal's stuff is more acting, which he may be the best actor in the company, with the exception of maybe again Foley. Mm -hmm. I think that. As an actor, he's tremendous. As an interview, he's very, very good. But I, you know, you know, he doesn't do those where he comes out there. Because even when he was doing that British stuff, and the people would boo him and all that, yeah, they used to like play the other guy's music and come out, and he would do the face like pretty quick. I mean, they never left him out there for like ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, which Hunter, you know, Hunter's out there for a long time, and it's it's, it's harder when you're out there for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, it's from Sterling Ridgeway. I took my wife to Raw on Monday. It was my first live WWE event. <laughs> great, great timing, dude. The situation with Trish was an embarrassment. I couldn't imagine bringing children to that show. I was embarrassed to have my wife there or for other women around. I was surprised at the pops, uh, Brock, Austin, Helmsley, and Hardys, uh, but some of the other biggest ones were Crash Holly, Kai and Ty, and the big show. The area where I was went crazy for the big show, 
and I thought I might change my mind about the Big Show because Al Snow and the Big Show match was very good. Uh, there were three chants for Jerry Lawler. There were a lot of signs to bring back the cat. Um, there were probably a whole lot more than you saw because they were confiscating him at the door. Uh, I thought the action was great. Even my wife, who is a non-wrestling fan, got hooked. Uh, I'm a Dudley's Mark. After the title change, I don't think there's a heel I love to hate more than Christian. The hosebag comment on the phone was hilarious. All right, weird I don't want to cause too. trouble, but I have a uh, suggestion for all of you that want to get a sign into an arena. Don't make the sign before you come to the arena. Make a sign that's blank on one side and bring a marker. A lot of people do that. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Not that I encourage that, but... Um, but the people who do that, they, well, they, I don't know. Uh, let's see. This was, I heard you were talking about the lesbian angle with Kimona and Beulah. The week before, ECW debuted on Prime Sports in Portland. They were on for two weeks. The lesbian angle aired, and that was their final show. Yeah, they were on up here, too, for two weeks. Yeah. Well, that's probably, probably, the, same, uh, probably the same network. Yeah, Prime Sports like, Northwest, I think it was. Yeah, Fox Sports Northwest or whatever it's called, yeah. Yeah. This is from Todd Martin. It goes, this is a clarification. I know it's been a while, but you did say the Giant was going to win uh, as far as on that... World War III didn't got to come out of nowhere. That's true. Because the original plan was for the Giant to win, and then they switched to Savage. And so he said that the Observer, two weeks before the event, you said the Giant was going to win, which at that time he was. And then the week before the event, you wrote that Savage was going to win, which, in fact, he did. He goes, I know this because I didn't get the Observer uh, until after where Savage said was going to win. So going to the pay-per-view, I actually thought the Giant was going to win. Or I last I heard was the Giant. So anyway, that's a clarification on that. Um, I do remember that. From Richard, did Peter Belfort compete in the 2000 Olympics? No, he did not. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, gosh, let's see, what do we got here? Ah, got some stuff from WWF. Uh, no Way Out, 550 to 575,000 buys. It's better than I thought it would do. It's pretty damn good. Uh, let's see, what do we have here? Uh, da, 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 da. God, look at this. We, okay, I'll have to go look through this stuff later. Uh, let's see. Uh, we already got this. Um, are you going to get, when are you going to get Lawler and Heyman on the show? Heyman, probably never. Lawler, when he gets that release. Uh, maybe. He wants to do it. From Alex Melly, Piper's book is going to be horrible. He still claims outcomes of matches are not predetermined. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's he's finally gotten off of that one. Uh, I hope, I hope he has. Um, he's to the point see. now where matches are fake except his. Oh, is that what he's doing? Oh not God, no. Yeah. It would be no. Uh, what about the Shockmaster? Oh yeah. Uh, where do you see Brett and Owen Hart in today's wrestling if Owen was still alive? Well, Owen would be in the WWF and he'd probably be feuding with Benoit and those guys, and he'd probably be motivated and he'd probably be awesome. Don't you think? Mm-hmm. I, I was thinking that, you know, like before that thing was going to go to trial, so a lot of people had asked me, like, where would he be? And there was like the two schools of thought. In the WWF, before that thing went to trial and it ended up being settled, the WWF was trying to portray that, you know, time had passed Owen Hart by, and if he was still there, he would be lucky to even have a spot on the roster. And then, of course, Owen Hart's side was trying to portray that he would be, you know, he probably wouldn't be as big as um, Austin or um, Helmsley. Or Rock, but he'd probably be as big as almost anyone else. Um, and I, my thought was, you know, it's basically trying to figure out, you know, future earnings and stuff. And I figured, if you look at what Benoit makes, that Owen would probably would have been pretty close to that. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's kind of how I. But but you know, the WWE, well, you know, it's, it's not surprising. I mean, I understand where they would be coming from. I mean, you, you know, if you're going to say if you're going to go to court with a guy, you're not going to go and say, you know. He was really an awesome worker. I mean, you're going to say that, like, well, you know, I mean, he was good, but, you know, time had passed him by, and he was slipping, and, you know, with the new roster we had, he wouldn't have been able to keep up. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This is from Simon Allen, who goes, I want to send you my list of the top five workers ever. Number one, Manami Toyota. At her best, she was the best. She was consistent at that level throughout her career. Number two, Akira Hokuto. How does anyone wrestle a match with a broken neck? Actually, people have done that. Um... Akira Hokuto didn't last long enough for me to, to for me to rate her that high, although she had awesome ring psychology. She was an excellent worker. Three, Kenny Kobashi, better per- performer than anyone else who ever lived, had many awesome matches. Number four, Misawa and Flair. Uh, Misawa, the greatest ring psychologist ever. Flair, America's greatest ever wrestler, but everyone else rated above him was every bit as consistent except for Misawa, who was his best better and his best match better than any of Flair's matches. 
and the end took way more punishment working the style, but they were all better pure athletes than Flair. Flair, I don't think anyone ever uh, said that. Well, yeah, you're probably right. But Flair was a hell of an athlete. Yeah. I don't think anyone would ever say that Ric Flair, as far as a wrestler, was the greatest pure athlete. Steamboat was a better athlete than Flair. Savage was a better athlete than Flair. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. On Jerry Lawler's website, his explanation mentioned that the, writer, the writer's names who had problems with the cat. I was wondering if some of those writers, Matt, wrestlers are mad at any of those writers for essentially firing Lawler, too. What was it? Brian Gewurz. Something going on with Brian Gewurz. I don't know what it is exactly. Do you know how much money Bret Hart made for Wrestling with Shadows? Yes, zero dollars. Do you know how much the WF made from it? Yes, zero dollars. Uh, let's see. Will Bret Hart's book talk about WF? God, Bret Hart. Will Bret Hart's book talk about WF only, or will it cover Calgary and WCW? It'll yeah, cover everything. Yeah. Also, notes don't mean accuracy. Uh, it's just how he saw things on that day. Does that make it accurate? Yeah, but it'll, no, be, but it'll be more like uh, historic. It'll be more. I shouldn't say historically, but like dates and. It'll be more accurate. It'll be as accurate as it can be. I mean, nothing's going to be 100 percent accurate. Yeah. Um, as far as the like screw Chris up, Jericho about... has uh, every single match he's ever wrestled written down. So that's right, he does. Screw up a date. That's right. Uh, let's see. Oh, a bunch of emails about the Shockmaster. About biggest screw ups. That was one of the biggest. Hell, that's actually the first one that came to my mind. Um. Uh. <laughs> this is actually pretty funny. I'm surprised you didn't notice this from Chris. Did you catch the interview on Nitro where Scott Steiner was in the ring saying that DDP was like a comedian because he sits in the crowd with the fans and they're all white trash? That was his reason why DDP was like a comedian. He meant a chameleon. <laughs> it was the single most incoherent thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it's really funny because it was so bad. Yeah, he meant chameleon. Uh, wasn't there a screw up in the WrestleMania 3 match? Wasn't three counts screwed up when Hogan tried to lift him up for a slam? Yeah, right? Didn't they count three? Yeah, it was like when a he tried pin to... or something like that. And like it was a pin, yeah. Hebner was, was like Hogan's on the wrong fault? side or something. I don't remember what it was, but... Was it Hogan's fault or the ref's fault? It may, you know, it may have been um, something where they were trying to give Andre an out because he was going to do the job at the end. Yeah. And it was to set up a rematch because later when they did a rematch, they showed that footage to like the, be the explanation of why there should be a rematch. Wasn't it like uh, Hogan was down and Andre was covering him and the ref was like on the other side of Andre, so Hogan like lifted his shoulder and, you know, the ref couldn't see it or whatever. It looked to me like it was something they had planned. Uh, see, as far as the greatest wrestler of all time, from Phil Schneider, what about Jumbo Ceruta? Um, I wouldn't say greatest of all time, but he was an excellent wrestler. He was great into his late 40s. That's not true because he died at 49, and, and Jumbo was pretty much done by the age of about 41, 42, when he got the hepatitis. But he worked well in the 70s and 80s and ushered in the 90s. That, that's true. He was one of the one of the very best in the 70s. He was one of the very... In the 80s, there were periods where he was kind of passed by, though. Other periods where he was right at the top. And, you know, by right around 1990-ish, I think he may have been the best worker in the whole business. Uh, he goes, Flair wrestled the same style all the time. It's true. It's a fair knock on Flair. But he always worked hard and had great matches. Uh, let's see. During Goldberg's big winning streak, he won one of his matches, tried grabbing the ropes like he always does, and stick his tongue out. But on this occasion, he missed the ropes and did a back somersault on the mat, stood up and stuck his tongue out. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that, too. Yeah. Um, da, 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 da. I understand that Shawn Michaels has quit the WWF. I haven't heard that. I don't think that's right. Um... What kind of moves and matches can Sean have with a bad back? I don't know. I, everyone thinks he'll come back and be great, though. You know, at least for the match. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Here's some more. At SummerSlam 89. I, oh, I remember this. When Gene Oakland was interviewing Rick Rude and Bobby Heenan in the SummerSlam, sign fell down in the background. Off screen, Vince McMahon muttered, nice move, sarcastically, and then Gene yelled out. I'm not going to say what he yelled out. You remember the that, don't F you? The F word, I believe. The F word. On an episode of ECW TV in 1995, Raven and Tommy Dreamer were brawling at the interview set. Part of the ECW banner moved, and you can clearly see Mrs. Heyman's washer and dryer. It's not Mrs. Heyman. That's Charlie or Ron's house. Everyone thinks that that's Paul Heyman's mom doing the ironing. I don't think Paul Heyman's mom irons. Maybe she does. I don't know. <laughs> Hulk Hogan, amazingly blatant blade job. Oh, he did. I've seen so many blatant blades. Yeah. Steve Austin Zamboni taking out the audio equipment during the live raw. Yeah, that was cute. Owen Hart. Yelling, and that's why I kick your leg from out from under your leg. <laughs> oh, let's go to Edward in Texas. Edward, what's going on? Yeah, I wanted to talk about the American Dragon. I've, yes. uh, I've had the opportunity to see him like uh, live three times uh, right after he got out of the school, and he was pretty good. And I was just wondering what y'all think about his progress so far since I haven't seen him in so many months. 
Um, we hear good things about him. I haven't seen him since the the, the only American Dragon stuff I've seen is is like his feud with Spanky in San Antonio. So oh. I haven't wa I haven't gotten any Memphis tapes. So I don't know, um, you know, if he's improved. I mean, he was really good for like his you know for his experience level. Really, really good. And you know, the Super Eight. You know, obviously the reports where he stole the show and they had some good people there. So, so that I you know obviously he's doing real well. Is there any chance that he might be called up anytime soon? I don't think so. Um, I mean, there's a chance, but you know, just when Ross mentions the names, I mean, it's not a name they mention. So, how tall I don't is he? He's, he's, he's a small he, guy. I mean, what would he you say? He can't be over two. He's got to be under two. He's pretty. Skinny. Oh, well, under two. I, yeah. I, I think he's like, I think he's like five six one one eighty one seventy five. Yeah. Does this sound about right? It's something like that. He, and he's he's barely like I don't know if he's six foot or maybe he's six one. Oh no 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 no. He's not. I don't think he could be more than five eight. Oh really? Well, he looked taller in the ring to me, I guess. But yeah, uh, I saw I mean, him I... one time when D'Lo Brown and S.A. Rios came to town to work a show for uh, the T.W.A. and it was them against him and Spanky, and they were—you could tell that they, you know, were outclassed, but they—they they really looked like they could compete at that level. I mean, it was a really good match. Size-wise, how do you match up with S.A. Rios? Like, was he the same size? He—he he was actually, uh, he was lighter than S.A. Rios. Okay, and S.A. Rios he looked is... He more lanky, more lankier than S.A. Like taller? Yeah, but S.A. is what, 5'5"? Five, five? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so, he did you know, look I mean, really good in that match, though. He's a good work. I mean, I, I mean, Shawn Michaels obviously trained some very good people. I mean, I Yeah, that first you know, class was incredible, all four of them, actually. Yeah, Spanky, you know, him and uh, Schultz. Those guys Schultz did... and Lance Cade. And Lance Cade, I thought, I thought had a good a good look, but I don't think it was quite, quite. Lance Cade was one of those guys where I thought actually would probably make it because of his size and because he's had that Barry Windham thing going for him. Yeah, but, but he's uh, too much of like a Bradshaw knockoff, you know, like a poor man's Bradshaw to me. Yeah, yeah. And the shooter shows is pretty good. I saw him and he wrestled Hardcore Holly at that show, and it was a pretty good match. And my God, Hardcore was so stiff on him; he was really taking it to him with mm -hmm. some of his forearms and kicks, and he gave him a good lesson on that show. And stuff. And uh, also, I wanted another a lightweight that I ne that never made it. Um, that, who I always thought was very good was Heavy Metal. I used to watch him against Rey Mysterio. Oh, yeah. I used to think he used to dominate Rey Mysterio, but he just never, you know, he just never made it. There were a lot of things. He he had a lot of drug problems, and you know, which I think is more than anything else what retarded his progress. Uh -huh. um, if he didn't have those problems, and there were some incidences in his career. That came back to haunt him. He'd have he'd have been one of those guys who came to WCW and was abused and, and drugged, yeah. and you know, and, all, and and would have been fired in the last run, run of firings. But it, um, you know, I just I watched mean, some EMLL from the uh, Tuesday show. I'm gonna get mm -hmm. the tapes now, and I just watching like uh, Viano Four and some of these guys and just Hoovy, and it's like, man, that is depressing. Silver King in Japan. I watched him, and it was like, oh my! I don't want to cry. I'm going like. WCW had him for all these years. This guy's like, I mean, he's every bit as good. I won't say better. He's every bit as good as Super Crazy. And everyone knows how good Super Crazy is. And the bottom line is, you know, if Super Crazy was in WCW, he would not have gotten chance one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, when you, when you close your mind to things, you don't see things. And it's really sad. Um, and it's, you know, it's hurt a lot of guys. It hurt a lot of guys in WCW that, God, they had a roster three years ago. I mean, you know, they really did. If you look at what they had, they could have they could have dominated the they could have dominated the business for for so long. But you know, they they had to kill off all those young guys, and it's 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 a terrible tragedy. And the fact that the company may not make it is is very sad because you know what? They really may have had the greatest roster of talent at one point of any company that I've ever seen. Yeah. Oh, by far. You know, them. You know, maybe WWF now or New Japan in the '80s. And them, those would be the best rosters I would have ever seen. But at least those companies had got longevity out of their roster. WCW didn't even get longevity out of it. They fired guys. They didn't give them. They, they buried them. And and look where they are now. I mean, New Japan. You know, New Japan never went bankrupt. Although they came close. They had they had their problems too in the 80s. And uh, WWF. You know, like this run. And there, I I just don't think three years from now the WWF is going to be like where WCW is. Could be wrong, but I don't know. Also, do you know about the heat between Shawn Michaels and Paul Diamond about why Paul Diamond left the TWA? I know there was heat. I don't know. Do you know? Do you know that one, Brian? I can't remember the story. Yeah, well, I just know he went back to. I think did he go to Win? I think he went to, Win went to Winnipeg somewhere. Yeah, he went, oh, uh, he went back to Canada. I'm not sure, but what the story was is that um he was staying at the house that him and his family were staying at was either owned or leased by Shawn Michaels, and Shawn Michaels was paying all the bills, 
and he kind of up and went and leased the house to somebody else without talking to Paul Diamond and just, you know, pretty much didn't really give him. They got into like a big argument about it, and that's ended up why he ended up leaving because Shawn Michaels leased the house right from under him, and he really couldn't afford to buy a new house, so he just went back to, to Canada. Okay. I mean, I just didn't know. I just remember that there was a falling out, and, and he left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much all I had, guys. So okay. Thanks for taking my call. I want to make mention uh, tomorrow on this show we're going to have Les Thatcher as our guest. We haven't had him on in a little while, and one of the favorite guests on the show. Next week we're pretty packed. We've got uh, Luthez on Monday. So those of you who want to know about old-time wrestling, history of wrestling, this is your show. You want to know how this thing evolved into what it is. Luthez has been, Luthez goes back to the 30s. And his mentor, Strano Lewis, goes back to the 1900s, and he probably has as good a knowledge of the inner workings of the wrestling industry during the 20s, 30s, 40s, through the 50s, of, of any man, because in the 50s, I mean, he was the guy in the 50s, and then he was still world champion in the 60s. Uh, anyway, he's book, got a book out. Anyway, uh, let's see. Wednesday, we're going to have Jeff Merrick of Live Audio Wrestling. Thursday, Cody Monk of the Dallas Morning News. Friday, Ken Shamrock. Right before he leaves for Japan for the Igor fight, so uh, we've got let me get we got full bank calls. I want to get through a few emails really quick. Uh, Phil Perona goes, the best worker ever was Sean, bar none. Um, I wouldn't. He's because uh, he's better than Flair if you combine athletics and talking. He's a better athlete than Flair. Not close to as good a talker. talker. Not close to as good a talker as Flair. Um, and Flair had way more longevity. Um, I mean, I've seen better workers than Shawn Michaels, and, I, and, it's, and he's, but he's one of those. You know, I was thinking when I read this, though, you know, if you, if you actually go during Shawn's big year, or 96 was his big year, and, and look at the quality of his matches, match by match, and compare him to Hunter in the last year, Hunter comes out way better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no one talks about Hunter as being one of the greatest of all time, but if he has a couple more years like this, uh, he's, he's going to be right up there. I mean, what about quality great, of opponents? Um, Hunter's had much better opponents than Sean, no doubt. Sean had match. I uh, know Sean had like that match with Kevin Nash. Uh, I just don't know that S Sean's matches with Sid weren't that good. I, I mean, think he were... had some. Uh, think of the opponents. But he had. You're right. Worse. He had worse. No, no, no. Hunter hasn't had the bad opponents. Well, hey, we're gonna see WrestleMania through, of course with Undertaker. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. What about Dynamite Kid? He's the most complete wrestler I ever saw. The best mass wrestler I ever saw was Blue Panther. I don't know if he's the best. You know the best Matt wrestler I think I've ever seen is, is Kiyoshi Tamura. Um, yeah, I would say that for sure. Volkan was really good. Blue Panther's really good. Uh, Dynamite Kid was great, great, great for his era. But I think Chris Benoit is far better than Dynamite Kid. Um, a lot of people will, because Dynamite was the original, but Benoit had fewer holes in his style. Dynamite Kid did a lot more crazy stuff, but I think Chris Benoit was better from, way better from a psychology standpoint than Dynamite ever was. Mm. Uh, Best flyer ever, Satoru Sayama. I'd say Mysterio at his peak would be the best flyer I ever saw. Sayama, like, was, was worlds above everyone else in his era, but, it, it, you know, like the style of dance. Sayama was the quickest wrestler I ever saw, though. I mean, I never saw anything. I think we'll all agree that Bruiser Brody was the best brawler. Um, very believable brawler. Yeah, maybe. And as for the biggest group of all time, do you remember? Rick Steiner, when he says, I am, Rick Steiner is my name. I don't yeah, if we that. count interviews, then uh, we could go on for about uh, a year straight on this show. Just list first off every Sid interview that's ever been cut. <laughs> been screwed. Oh, remember, remember that? Oh, he used to have classics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Sometimes for fun, I'll just um, I'll just transcribe something that Sid says in the newsletter, and I just read it back, and it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Do either WWF or WCW have rating projections similar to what they have to make good for advertisers similar to the XFL? Yes, they, they do. And, and WCW, that's why WCW couldn't shut down, was because they have to make good to their advertisers because they promised them a much higher number for Nitro than they delivered. And he goes, um, do you know the numbers? Okay, where was it? Cause as hideous as it sounds, wasn't a three-hour Nitro more probable than a two-hour version? Oh, absolutely. Remember when they switched one of the big things that uh, you and I both wrote about, and no one else did, was how much it was going to hurt the, the profitability of the company by switching, even though I, I'm not against... When they did that move from 3 to 2, I thought it was the right move at the time. But one of the reasons they lost so much money that year was because of that move, because they the production was almost the same. 
for a three-hour show is a two. It's not that much more, and they're losing one-third of their ad revenue. As it turns out, they lost way more than one-third of their ad revenue because the ratings ended up dropping, so they lost. Yeah, I mean, hypothetically, the ratings should have gone up, and it went Well, down. that's what Russo said. Russo, when he cut it, said that the, they had to get their numbers up to average a like 4.2, a 4.142 to even out the loss of revenue by cutting that third hour. And Russo said they were going to get it up to, the, to a four just by cutting that third hour, and obviously... They're not even half of that now, or they are just barely half of that now because they're at two one pretty consistently. Someone says I can't find wrestling title history books. Do you know the website? Archeus A R C H E U S at GaryWill dot com. Uh, let's go to Mike in California. Mike, what's going on? Hey guys, how you doing? Hey, doing really good. Cool. I got a couple questions for you and statement. Um, first of all, uh, I know WWE is in a lot of trouble right now, but uh, do you know who came up with the cruiserweight tie, uh, tag team uh, tournament? Uh, the idea? Yeah. Was, it, was, that, was that Bob Ryder? Someone told me it was Bob Ryder. Okay, here's the deal. The truth... I, I mean, I, mean I, I could be dead wrong on that one, though. I'm not, I'm not sure. I yes. gave them that idea on WSW Live 10 days before they used that idea. And Jeremy Borosh told me on WSW Live that the day after they used it, I called and I said, thanks for using your, uh, my idea. I appreciate it a lot. Um, I'm grateful, you know, that you used my idea. And they just... But Jeremy told me, you didn't be that was in your idea. Um, that was uh, Johnny Ace's idea, and he shared that idea with us uh, when he was last on in January. So I listened to Johnny Ace's interview in January, and nowhere they mentioned uh, the Cruiserweight Tag Teams, but nowhere did they mention the tournament. That was my idea. And, uh, you know, I just thought that that was really rude of those guys over there just downplaying, like, a fan who's trying to help them out. And I'm a really creative guy who has plenty of ideas for them. Do you have you guys ever seen uh, Logan's Run? The TV show? Uh, the movie or, Lo or uh, Ocean's Eleven? I remember it. I mean, but I don't even. I was so busy watching wrestling that I don't remember much about it, other than I remember there was a TV show. I understand. One of the the episode in the Twilight Zone movie that Steven Spielberg directed was written by George Clayton Johnson, and he's my mentor as a writer. I'm a screenwriter, and. Um, I've mentioned it to Jeremy that I've liked to write for WCW before, and he just downplays me. And uh, my mentor tells me, don't even go into wrestling as a writer. And I've uh, he's him, probably right. probably a wise man. Yeah, yeah. but I, I know that I could just supply so much of a better product than what they're doing. I feel I could conquer the WWF uh, with my ideas. I've had plenty of other ideas that they've used. They just don't know it. And uh, <laughs> Maybe they're afraid to owe you money. <laughs> I just feel like abused as a fan by them and their show that they put on. <laughs> I do TV. too. <laughs> huh? I do too. It's just it's, I've been watching no... it every Monday and Wednesday, and you know, for all these years, just I hoping know. and praying that you know they finally get their act together. Yeah. Does Eric Bischoff listen to your show at all or anything? He doesn't listen to the show, but you know, I talk to Eric Bischoff from time well, to time. If you want to drop him my email, if he's interested in a good writer. It's hero9 at AOL.com. Okay. And if he's interested, and I just wanted to let you know where I think WSW Live belongs. And just give me a second. Here it is. All right. All right. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Jerry. Hey, what's up, guys? Not too much. What's going How's on? How's it going? Hey. It's going okay. Uh, I had just a couple questions for you in regards to the leftovers from ECW and where you think they might end up, such as... Uh, okay. Tommy Dreamer. I mean, everybody from Joey Styles Dream on commentary to uh, Francine. Dreamer, Dreamer's going to end up, I think, in the WWF, but I don't know if they'll let him wrestle. He may just end up being like a road agent or, or like a, a like a, a writer, booker type of thing. He's still a young guy, though, isn't he? He's 30, but he's, he's too beat up. He, um, you know, if you watch his work, I mean, you got you know, he, he can do all the shortcuts in WW, in W, in the, in ECW, you know, where you walk around, hit guys with signs and stuff like that, but in WWF, he couldn't get away with it, and it'd be... He can't go up and down and all that stuff anymore. I yeah. mean, he just took too much punishment. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Um, what about any plans to bring on Joey Styles as far as commentary goes? Because I think he'd be a lot better than, I mean, and I'm not one to judge because I'm not in the business. I don't work, you know, doing what they do. But I think he'd be better as a color commentator or than uh, Michael Cole would be. I'd you don't find a lot Michael of arguments has, like, on no that. No presence whatsoever, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, I I mean a lot of people. I mean, who, have, have, you have to think who's he going to team with? You know, is it going to be Joey Styles and Jim Ross? 
Joey Styles and Taz. Yeah. On, on SmackDown, it's better than Michael Cole and Taz. I don't. I'm not looking forward to Michael Cole and Taz week in and week out. And it's not. And it's more because of Michael Cole than Taz, because I've seen them. The little bit of heat that I've seen. Did something happen uh, with just, Michael Cole and Taz? I don't know. Did what last night? I mean, at, at, at the, the TV. I didn't hear. I don't know. I think something did. I don't know what it was though. They're supposed to be setting up an angle where uh, Michael Cole gets pissed off at Taz always giving them trouble, and so he goes after him or something. That's, that's what I read, anyways, for whatever that's worth. Hmm. But, uh, okay. anyways, one last thing is, I don't know if you guys remember this at all or what the validity is to it, but a few, well, now more than a few years ago, is it true that before a pay-per-view in the early 90s, Randy Savage punched Hulk Hogan in the eye? I they got an argument over something, and he socked Hogan, and they had to put makeup on it before Maybe the show? Maybe again. No, 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 that was, that was, the pizza was, ho <laughs> the pizza's hot. That was very <laughs> angry when, uh, you approach his pizzas. Yeah, the, the, this was before the WrestleMania, God, was it the Vegas WrestleMania? I think it was the one, uh, maybe it was ho nine. Okay, it was, it, it was the one where they said they had a speedboat accident. I believe that the speedboat accident was a true story, but, you know, I mean, I've heard so many times that Savage actually punched him. Maybe it was an accident because Savage punched him on a steamboat. In the, uh, the speedboat. The speedboat, and they <laughs> crashed. I don't know. I mean, I've heard both stories, and I don't know which one's true. I mean, I know that the, all the friends of Hogan say that it was the speedboat, and the Savage rumor was out. You know, Savage and Hogan, they've had a love-hate relationship, you know, ever since Savage's marriage broke up. And probably even before then, you know, they probably had one, just because it's just the nature of, you know, two wrestlers that are, you know, Ego's probably... Laughing. Egos clash. You know, Savage is a million times better worker, probably jealous that Hogan was a bigger star. Hogan may be jealous. Oh, who knows what? Who knows what? You know, because they were... It's like those two guys that don't like each other but need each other, and then, like, they end up back together again. Kind of like, you know, like like Lawler and... Like, like I shouldn't say Lawler, because that's not really a fair one, but, like, a lot of guys with McMahon, you know, that really... You know, it's like they, they really don't like him, and they're gone from him, but you know they're going to end up back with him because they just have no choice. Oh, okay. All right. One last thing, then I gotta go. Uh, I was reading today that, in regards to Don Callis possibly doing any color commentary, that that's that he burned a bridge in the WWF due to when he was there as the Jackal, and I was wondering if there was any validity to that. He doesn't want to go back there. I don't think. Um, I don't know what burn a bridge. You know, it's like there are guys who who did stuff that you would think would never be back, and they come. And back. I don't even remember what. Don Callis, it was just like, you know, Bruce Pritchard didn't like him. You know, Bruce, and, and some of the guys didn't like him because of his managing in those days. But, I mean, I don't remember it being, and they fired him, but I don't remember it being any great thing where it would be like, oh, we'll never have him back or anything like that. I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't a big deal at the time other than, you know, they, you know, I mean, the other Truth Commission guys end up getting rid of too, so. Right. Uh, um, well, wasn't uh, but, uh, but Bo Buchanan this, in the Truth Commission? Or no? Yeah. Yes, yeah, Bo Buchanan. Bo Buchanan was, yes, Bo Buchanan was, um, Rambo with Pre recon, recon, wasn't he? He was recon, yeah. And then who was the other one? Well, the other one, Kurgan was the original other one. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, I guess the Sid can get back in WCW after stabbing Arn Anderson. Anybody can get back anywhere. There All you right, go. Guys, well, thanks a lot. You have a great show. Take care. Okay. How long do you think man? before somebody attacks Sid in the hospital? They should do something with Sid. You know, give us sympathy for his re return. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. They really should. I mean, I'm, I'm whatever. Uh, what can I say? This is from Steve Aniel. goes about the Canyon Cat Hospital angle. Before Canyon pulls the curtain between Miss Jones and the other patient, you can see that the second patient is actually a dummy with a balloon head and a face drawn on it. I, I didn't <laughs> notice that. I didn't notice that. I completely believe it. Oh, God. Uh, let's go to John. John, what's going on? Yo, Dave. Yes. Yeah. What's up, man? Not too much. What's up? Hey, listen, I want to know, is the deal with Fusion and WCW a, um, a work or a shoot and Eric already got it? Because a lot of his guys are getting pushed and in main events. Eric is, I have Eric an idea is, what might happen. They might have a couple of guys come out in the ring and say, you know, WCW's done. All the wrestlers come to the ringside. Then Eric will come out and say, hold it, hold it, hold it. No, 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 no. Is that going to happen that, 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 and he already bought the company? That that may happen, but um, as far as Eric Eric is is pretty much in control of the direction of the booking because they are under the impression that they are going to sell. The sale is not has not uh, you know finalized. Is it's it also, going to be? I, I, no one knows a hundred percent. I mean, I think it 
probably there there there's gonna be a lot of red faces if it's not. I think it probably will be, but I can't say that with any certainty. Um, and, and nothing's gonna happen this week because Brad Siegel's on vacation all week anyway. So it ain't gonna happen this week. It may happen. It may happen next week. You know. I mean, are they why? Why are they keep saying the, the new owners, new owners? Giovanni keeps saying that. You know. That's the that's that's Eric's that's Eric storyline. Eric's storyline because Eric, you know, what Eric's thing is just to put as much heat on the heels as possible, and then have the new owners come in and save the day. I mean, that's that's his basic you know thing he's trying to build to so when the day comes when the storyline you know the storyline new owners angle may take longer than the actual sale because the actual sale could be done in a couple of weeks the storyline new owners angle but is I can't it, imagine I can't imagine that one taking place you know for a while well, just the way is the it going to be settled is it going to be finalized I mean do does Eric want this company Eric wants the company I can't say 100% it's going to be finalized or not because no one no one knows until the deal until the deal's signed there's no deal I think they have lots of lawsuits and that's why Fusion's speculating whether to do it or not it's not the lawsuits have nothing to do with the deal because the lawsuits are all against Time Warner mm-hmm. so that's not that's not even an issue but there are issues I mean there's an issue there's an issue that this company's losing a lot of money and do they want to sink money in do they think they can turn it around I mean there are issues out there and I think Eric can do I think he can do this. He did it once, 96 weeks, he beat the WWF. It was 83. It was a lot different. And it was a different landscape, and it was a totally different business, and it was a different WWF. Well, let me ask you It was a really different WWF. It was WWF asleep at the wheel at that time, you got to remember. I was told, I read somewhere on the Internet where Eric said he wasn't worried about the ratings. I beat the WWF. It's not the talent beating WCW. It's the things he does, because the talent he has, I beat. Is that true? <sighs> no. <laughs> you don't think he, so. you think the talent he, he, in the WCW the talent Vince has Eric the talent Vince has the talent Vince has kills the talent the WCW has right now. It's not even in the, the same way. Vince has Eric had. Yeah, well, but he had he, 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 he had all the WWF with the same talent that Vince has now. So shouldn't that mean that Vince now will beat him? No, actually, it wouldn't mean that. But um, he beat. I mean, if you look at the the guys that are the the big money players, which is Rock. Rock was never a big money. I mean, Rock was there as a rookie. This Rock wasn't there then. Austin was just getting to where he was, but the Austin peak started in '98 with the Tyson angle, and that was uh, when the thing turned around. And uh, you know, Helmsley. You know, Helmsley was on the roster then, but it wasn't this Helmsley. Because 40 yeah. pounds lighter, not half as good. <laughs> and why are they bearing Taz? Because uh, he's too small for their, for Vince's taste. You think so? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, it's, 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 they, they don't they don't push they don't push short guys. Crash Holly, they push. They gave he beat they everybody. Didn't push Crash Holly. Crash Holly was a comedy figure in the hardcore division. They got over um, while they were amusing themselves, and now they're not pushing him at all. Oh, all right, Dave. Okay. Thanks for your time. Okay. Uh, let's see. What do we have here? Uh, from Ryan Regan. Uh, let's see. How did Rick Rude die? It was a uh, overdose of several drugs. Uh, how come Demolitions never consumed one of the greatest tag teams in the WWF when they held the tag team titles for over a year? Just because they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the reason. Uh, who were the rumored guys in 96 to be Hall and Nash's partner at Bash on the Beach before Hogan was put in? It was always Hogan. I just, I just want everyone to know that. Um, I mean, I knew weeks ahead of time that, that it was Hogan. I mean, like a lot of people thought it was like some decision made at the end. I mean, weeks ahead of time, I, 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 I'd been told. So that's what it was. Uh, let's see. We were at Raw Monday. Not only was Vince's act deplorable, but embarrassing. Many, many children and teenagers were there and were not happy with this. I would think the kids and teenagers were real happy. Yeah. They were girls. Um, and how Vince tried to humiliate her. They wanted to see puppies. Uh, they did when Deborah was on the screen. The event staff were specifically removed all and every sign they could find with Jerry Lawler and Stacy. Of course, that I'm not a prude. My family's watched WWF since the '80s. We've attended all the events at the MCI Center since since '99. After last night, my 23-year-old son, who's a diehard fan and loves uh, WWF, is not interested in Vince's garbage. He left before the main event, claiming he didn't feel well and wanted to beat the traffic. Left before the main event. Well, that main event too. That's a hell of a main event too. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, any thoughts on Shawn Michaels' comeback? You know, okay, we're, okay, let me just answer this and then we'll get out of here. Um, again, with, with Shawn Michaels, 
you know, I don't think that anyone can make any decisions until we see him in the ring and know what he can and can't do. And also, not just see him in the ring, but see how he feels after that first match. I mean, if he's 100%, which he'll never be, he's not going to be 100%. I mean, if he's 100% and he was the old Shawn Michaels, of course, you know, he'd be phenomenal. Um, he's not going to be that. If he's going to be 50%, he might be okay. If he's 30%, he may not be okay. Yeah. You don't know. I, it's like when, when people are asking about Sean all the time. Hey, there's I a really poll question for you right there. What? What, what percentage do you think Sean will be when he returns? None of us know. Sean doesn't even know. Mm -hmm. He hasn't taken bumps. He doesn't know how his body's going to hold up. You know, I mean, his doctor told him never to do this again. I mean, doctors have been wrong, but doctors have also been right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I think the best angle for Rock and Austin involves Sean. Get rid of Deborah and bring in Sean. Uh, okay. Anyway, we are totally out of time right now. And I want to thank Brian and Al. And uh, tomorrow we're going to have Les Thatcher up. We'll finish up the week. We'll see you all at 5.